Hello and welcome to Lecture 26 of Data to Decision. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this class. This lecture is on correcting for heteroscedasticity, how to stabilize the variance when it is varying. In our last lecture, uh, Lecture 24, I believe uh, the last uh, PowerPoint lecture we had, we talked about the causes of heteroscedasticity, and then in Lecture 25, I showed how in using uh, Excel or even better using R, we can run some tests for heteroscedasticity. But now we'll talk about what to do if we find it. So to review, we said that heteroscedasticity is caused by a number of things, but one of the most common reasons we see uh, this change in variance as a function of the predicted Y value is that we have the wrong model. If you have the wrong model, uh, you will get systematic variation in the residuals, which can show up in the presence of other noise, uh, real random errors, uh, as looking like heteroscedasticity. In fact, if you have the wrong model, almost every test for heteroscedasticity will, will show that it exists. Um, so the first thing you want to do is to be confident you've got the right model, that you're capturing all the systematic effects, and the only thing left over is random effects. And that's the case, and only when you're convinced that that's the case should we start thinking about what can we do to fix the heteroscasticity of our residuals. The consequence of having a non-constant uh, variance in our residuals is that our estimator, for the model parameters will be inefficient. We will still get unbiased estimates so that it is the best uh, we can do with large amounts of data. But it will be inefficient in the sense that the confidence intervals will be larger than they would be if you didn't have heteroscedasticity. In other words, the standard errors of each of the coefficients will be large. And even worse, you won't know what they are. You won't know what the standard errors are because if you make the assumption that you have a constant variance and you fit the model, assuming that, the calculations of these standard errors, making that assumption, will not be accurate. Sometimes they'll be too big, sometimes they'll be too small, but they won't give you the true answer as to what the confidence intervals around each of your parameters are and around any predicted values that you'll get from using this model. Now, that said, it takes a reasonable amount of heteroscedasticity before you run into problems. The rule of thumb I like to use is that the standard deviation of the residuals needs to change by at least a factor of two across the range of x values or across the range of predicted y values before you need to worry too much about it. In other words, the variance has to be changing by a factor of four or more. If you see a little bit of change, Yes, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, you'll lose a little bit of efficiency, but it's not enough to justify anything you might do to try to fix it. But if the variance is changing by a factor of four or more, then you need to do something about it. So what do you do? Well, if you know how the variance changes for each y, each data point, then we will use something called a weighted regression. We weight the uh, importance of each data point to our regression based on our estimate of what the variance of that data point is. We're going to do that very soon, a couple lectures from now. Uh, and this will be our main tool for dealing with heteroscedasticity. The best way to use this is if we have some independent knowledge of how the variance varies from data point to data point. If you don't have any knowledge, you just see uh, uh, this uh, heteroscedasticity, there are some statistical techniques uh, that you can use. Generalized method of moments, for example. We are not going to do that in this class. We're just not going to get into it at all. Um, we're going to assume either there is no heteroscedasticity worth worrying about, or if there is, we can identify it and understand its trends. If we know the general trend of the variance, with the predictive variable. 
We can also use something called a transformation. We can transform the data to make it homoscedastic. Uh, we're going to talk about weighted regression in a couple of lectures. So we'll come back to that. That's going to be our main choice, our main way of dealing with this problem. But I want to talk about transformations as well. So how can we transform the data? Suppose I have a model that's just a simple straight line. So here's my straight line uh, model with one predictor variable. Let's say that we know, either from a theoretical understanding of, of this problem, or because we observe it with a lot of data that we've collected, suppose we know that the variance of each residual is linearly proportional to the value of xi, or in this case, the value of yi as well. And again, we might know this because of some theoretical considerations of, of how the, the data is working, or we might just observe it. And if you have enough data, you might be able to get a fairly good understanding of how variance changes with xi, x, the predictor variable. Well, if that's the case, I can fix variance um, by taking the square root. So the, the variance proportional to x, that means the standard deviation is proportional to the square root of x. So I can take this equation and divide everything by the square root of x. If I do that, just the yi gets divided by the square root of x, a to 0 by the square root of x, um, x gets divided by the square root of x, and the residuals get divided by the square root of x. Now, if I look at this and ask, what's the variance of this new residual, epsilon i prime? Well, if, if the variance of epsilon i is proportional to x, this thing must be a constant. So I will now do a new fit. My transformed y's versus how? I have two variables that I have to fit. I've got a variable 1 over the square root of xi, and I have a second variable equal to the square root of xi, and I have to fit both of them. This becomes a multiple regression problem. Now, we haven't done multiple regressions yet in this class. We're about to very soon. It's very easy to do. It's no harder than doing uh, a regression with a single um, uh, predictor variable. Nonetheless, it doesn't require that change. Note also that in this particular model, there's no intercept term. So we'd have to model it without the intercept. Alternately, if we use weighted regression and we knew that this was the way variance varied, I, I end up weighting uh, each of my data points by 1 over the variance in a weighted regression. So I would simply weight each of the data points by 1 over x. And it does exactly the same thing. And I think that's an easier approach to go. So we're going to stick with weighted regression for most of what we do. Uh, transforming the data is popular, though, especially in the exploratory phases of looking at our data. The two most common transforms are the logarithm transformation and the square root transformation, uh, especially if, if we've got an exponential model. Well, you might think about taking the log of the entire equation and then fitting the log of y versus linear model in x, for example. Um, if I have a power law model, y goes as x to some power, I could use the log of both y and x and fit it to a straight line. Uh, sometimes uh, processes, for example, have a Poisson distribution where the variance equals the mean. In that case, uh, taking the square root of y has a tendency to straighten out that variance. Now, here is an important point that's not necessarily obvious unless you've thought about it for a little while. Suppose I have a model that's y is proportional to x squared. So my output is y, my, my, my uh, predictor variable is x squared, and I want to model that. Well, from a model perspective, that's the same thing as the square root of y proportional to x. right? Mathematically, those are exactly the same. But when we're fitting models, they are not the same. because They have different error models. And remember, the error term and what you assume about that error term is a part of the model. So even though the, the y hat function I could express as y hat 
as a function of x squared or the square root of y hat as a function of x, those can be exactly the same, still they're different models. One might do a better job of being fit using ordinary least squares compared to the other. That's the power of transforming the data. Now, sometimes we don't know a transformation that will work. Um, in that case, we can systematize our search for a transformation, what's called the Box-Cox transformation approach. In the Box-Cox transformation, we're basically going to vary power of y and try out lots of different powers to see which one makes the data fit better. So uh, we, the transformation is actually going to be y to some power lambda, and then we normalize it by subtracting 1 and divided by lambda. Um, it just makes the numerics work out better. And if lambda happens to be 0, then we'll take the log of y. So almost by definition, lambda equals 0, we do the logarithm of y. Then uh, we have a whole bunch of models. We find the best fit value not only of beta 0 and beta 1, but of lambda as well. Um, alternately, we could do an ordinary least squares and simply change the value of lambda and try out each one and find out which one has a minimum uh, standard error, for example. Uh, standard error of the residuals I'm in. Now, you can vary lambda in very small increments or very large increments, but from a practical perspective, um, raising y to the 0.36 power, uh, it's, it probably doesn't mean that much. Uh, so we typically will change powers by, say, around to a multiple of 0.5. So uh, square root of y, y to the 3 halves power, etc. Uh, when we look at how to do Box-Cox transformations in R, we'll see how easy it is, in fact, to find the optimum lambda. It's important to note that this transformation requires that all the y values are bigger than 0. You can't take the square root of minus 5. So uh, there are some cases where your y data is naturally going to be negative. Uh, one way to deal with that would be to Add a constant, shift everything up, and try that. Um, but uh, uh, the results can vary depending on the constant you use. So uh, it's not obvious what to do if you have some negative values of y. Now, the Box-Cox transformation doesn't just affect, affect the issues of heteroscedasticity. First of all, it changes the model. It's not like the earlier transformation approach that I was discussing where you're using the same model, just putting it in a different form. Here we're actually changing the model. If you're going to change the model, then um, well, you have to be OK with that. Uh, often we'll do this when we're exploring, looking for models. But it also changes the error distribution. Sometimes uh, you'll have a very non-normal distribution, but after the Box-Cox transformation, the distribution is closer to normal. Of course, the opposite could occur. It can change the heteroscedasticity. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, if you've checked for the normality of your errors, etc., uh, then you try a Box-Cox transformation. You got to go back and do all these checks again because everything could be different after this transformation. And we have one final approach dealing with heteroscedasticity. Uh, another approach that we're going to take on later in the semester. We're making the assumption of a normal probability with a constant variance. If we see that that does not work, it could be that a different distribution is required. Uh, it could be the gamma distribution is required, for example. And it might be that under a different distribution, you can achieve uh, homoscedasticity. Uh, so if you want to assume a different distribution from normal, and then you want to do a least squares regression, or excuse me, a a regression of some sort, uh, for example, a maximum likelihood regression. Well, we can do that with a technique called generalized linear modeling. Now, we can do general, generalized linear modeling in R and in other software packages just as easily as we can do ordinary linear modeling. So as it turns out, this is not a big um, impediment for our abilities to 
uh, get good models. Um, we're going to talk about this topic and do some examples of generalized linear modeling later in the semester. All right, what have we learned in lecture 26? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. Under what circumstances is it appropriate to take remedial action against heteroscedasticity? You've looked at your data, you suspect it might be there, you've done a test, it says you can reject the null hypothesis that the variance is constant. You think, I'm going to do something. Under what circumstances is it appropriate? What are the two main approaches to addressing heteroscedasticity? All right, here's the answer. The two main approaches are weighted regression and data transformation. When will you choose one or the other? Those are our questions for our lecture 26 uh, final points. Until next time.